and I believe this goes for a lot of things about leadership, but there's a propensity for action. You act and then course correct. Welcome to Create New Futures. Thought-provoking conversations with leaders, experts, and interesting minds. Join us as we explore ideas and reflect on practices that you can use and apply to create and shape the future. With your host, author, and strategy consultant, Aviv Shahar. Welcome to Create New Futures, where we develop conversations with successful leaders and interesting people to explore how to create new futures for you and for your business. This is Aviv, and today I'm speaking with Ted Clark. Ted has 35 years of leadership experience across all aspects of mobile computing. He was the senior vice president and general manager of HP's notebook PC division starting at 2004 through 2012. In his role, he led HP's largest and most profitable product division, delivering 165 million notebook PCs and $125 billion in revenue. For more than two years, HP's notebook PC division shipped more than one PC per second worldwide. Ted and his team gained and then maintained the number one position worldwide in the notebook PC market share for 22 consecutive quarters. Ted thrives in a fast-paced, complex business environment in both mature and emerging technologies and categories. He has deep understanding about what it takes to build empowered and flexible teams and win in the hyper-growth technology space. He now consults companies focused on building a winning market position by helping leadership teams drive execution that delivers results. I initially met Ted and worked with one of his teams in 2005, and we have then continued to collaborate in the following seven years until he retired from HP. In this conversation, Ted reflects on his leadership learning and on what enabled him to achieve with his organization these remarkable success milestones. Here then is my conversation with Ted. Ted, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Aviv, it's great to be with you. Uh, It's great to speak with you again. Let me first ask, how are you? What's life post-corporate career like? Well, it's been very good, Aviv. It has allowed me to step back a bit and reflect. And uh, I'm, I'm a very thankful for uh, my corporate uh, life. And I've moved on to some other ventures, both with family, uh, which has been wonderful, uh, golf, which has been frustrating <laughs> and some some engagements with some startup companies as well as some large businesses yes well i do have to ask about your latest achievements in the game of golf ah uh, yes i'm not sure achievements <laughs> would uh, be the right word although I, I have learned some interesting things one one thing that happened to me and I would I say it almost as it happened to me is that in the first two and a half years after retirement from HP, I actually made four hole in ones, which is just the strangest, craziest thing and hadn't had one before, haven't had one since. So something about that retirement was <laughs> was good, was good for the uh, golf game. But um Since then, it's been frustrating, and actually I've learned that golf is better when you play and make a game plan and have some goals. And as maybe that's obvious, but it's different than other sports I've played, which is, you know, you go out there and you try not to think, and you try not to uh, be too cerebral. But with golf, I think it's a little better to actually plan out a strategy and try and execute it, although I'm not very good at that part. That's very interesting and uh, quite a metaphor to, to many other things. I have to also ask at, at this stage then, what do you miss most from the 
corporate, busy, high-intensity leadership role that, that you have led. And what was the greatest challenge in transitioning from a corporate career to discovering a new life? That's a great question, but it's an easy question. I mean, without, without a doubt, I miss uh, the team interaction. I uh, have so much, had so much respect for my team, such a uh, incredible group of, of people, and I still keep in touch with many of them. But just, you know, when you take the pressure cooker and the intensity out of it, it's really all about human interaction, which uh, you know better than I do. And having that camaraderie and that team uh, spirit on a daily, weekly, monthly basis is, is certainly, uh, was certainly missed. You know, I think that the high pressure part, it took a while to decompress. In fact, I would say it took probably six months to not wake up with that same intensity and that, you know, checklist of five or 10 key items that you would want to go about on a daily basis. I'd propose that six months is actually quite fast, but that the art of such a transition is in finding a way to channel some of the habits and some of the ways you programmed yourself to operate, some aspects of it, not all of it, into the new pursuits that you are developing. And I know that you have gradually moved into some of these. So just give us a sense of where do you currently get a chance to exercise your experience and business savvy? Yes. Um, I'm actually, when I first retired, I had a fairly extensive engagement with a large, with a large company. And now I've got a couple of engagements with startups, and I find those to be challenging and fun. And uh, so I get to channel my energies there. And, and, you know, in some ways, I started my career with a technology startup and, you know, then spent 21, 22 years with obviously a large corporation. And now I'm back to working in, in the startup mode. And it's been a nice cycle to go back and see what I know now that I didn't know then about how to help and coach, if you will, the the emerging side of the technology equation. So uh, that's that's really where I've channeled my energy, as well as I said, um, being able to spend time with my family and that's just been, that's been a blessing. Great, so we're going to want to circle back to the kind of wisdom that you're able to bring to these startup teams in a bit. But I want to first reflect back because it seems to me that you have had a very unique opportunity. I talk in Create New Futures about the riddle that I ask teams, which is, what is the most difficult thing in the world? By which I mean, what is the most difficult challenge to overcome and or what is the most difficult conundrum to solve? And ask people to not cheat and write down their answer before they read on. So those of you listening and hearing this for the first time, press a pause uh, here and answer this question first. What is the most difficult thing in the world? Now, I typically get different kinds of answers to this question. They include, for example, that the most difficult thing in the world is to win a Nobel Prize or to win an Olympic gold medal. And some say to quickly recover from setbacks and or to become a leading authority in your field. Some will say to live regret-free, to be truly happy. Some will say to become a U.S. president. <laughs> I'm not sure it's any, it will continue to qualify. <laughs> Uh, this, these are all good answers, but they're all narrowly framed. And I am seeking a bigger, more meta-level answer that can contain many of these and other answers. The point I then make is that the most difficult thing, the, the most difficult achievement to realize is not getting rich. It is not 
being on stage performing or even winning the Nobel Prize, but rather that the most difficult thing in the world is to get all the right ingredients in the right place at the right time. One fantastic example on the world stage in the field of music is, of course, the story of the Beatles, because they obviously had the right stuff, the right ingredients, and they came together at the the right time and in the right place to become the Beatles. And I'm framing this story here because it really is quite a rare situation in business. And yet it seems to me that when you were leading the HP's notebook PC business, you've had the right ingredients in the right place at the right time. So so two questions to you. First, do you agree with this observation? And second, what was the journey that got you there? And then, of course, we can do a deep dive into these high-velocity growth years. Yes, so it's interesting you frame it that way. First of all, congratulations on the book. I recall that section where you posed that question. And I did pause. And, and to your point, as I was thinking about our conversation today, I actually thought those the very same thing, which is I was able, and a lot of it was being in the right place at the right time in terms of the the inflection point for notebook PCs, the demand in the market, and having an absolutely incredibly experienced team that through just good fortune, I was promoted to uh, lead. And that team, with all of their experience, both new to my team and new and experienced within HP, Compaq and HP at the time, I was absolutely, all of those ingredients came together. And now that you think about it, now that you mention it, I could think of it, I could think of us as the Beatles of the notebook marketplace, if you will, because any success that I had was absolutely due to the success and the experience and the knowledge and the risk-taking ability of that group of people. It was a remarkable group of people, and I was honored to lead them uh, and learn from them throughout that extremely rapidly growing hyper-growth, as you call it, period. So I certainly agree. I certainly agree with your premise and assumption that a lot of things came together, and I was fortunate enough to be part of that group. Right. So, so let's, let's do two things. Let's put a magnifying glass first to decode some of the key elements and key milestones that brought you to that point. Often, it's very difficult to replicate any story like this because it is so uniquely, always so uniquely contextual to the time and to the journey. But I'm interested if you can reflect, what were some of the, in your career, you're saying you you were lucky or privileged to be promoted, but there are some things that happened that led you the the right person at that time to be promoted. I'm interested if you can reflect on some of those experiences that led you to to this. So, So personally, I think I started back in the early 80s and Uh, I remember it like yesterday in 1982 at a computer conference, seeing the first, what I viewed as the first flat panel notebook PC. And immediately, I mean, it was like a light bulb went off and I said, this is what I want to do. And for the next 30 years or so, that's exactly what uh, I did. I happened to be academically trained in electrical engineering so I had credibility. I quickly learned that engineering was too difficult for me. So I, I then actually went to the field and I learned what it took to find a customer and keep a customer. And when you work in kind of headquarters, if you've never been out to interact with customers 
it's you just need that part of it, the experience. So I, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. And I think I also, from working with customers and knowing a lot and having a passion and a lot of enthusiasm for mobile computing, and we called at that time laptops were were that was mobile computing as opposed to today when mobile computing means your phone. Hmm. Um, but I also and and this has evolved and you and uh, interacting with you and reading your book has really helped me with this. But uh, and you mentioned this as one of the first things in your book. I actually learned to tell simple, powerful stories. And early on, I I really kind of learned that, you know, facts, there's a lot of fact based things in product development. But facts quickly fade, and I, I've I've reworded this because I heard it stated this way, and I, I believe this. Facts quickly fade, but stories last forever. And if you can get a team who sits and understands and believes in a story, you are a long way toward becoming a winning leader. And and that that dovetails. I mean, I was very interested in. In the introduction and in the, in the beginning part of your book, describing that, uh, I believe it was your, your father or your grandfather um, telling stories, and that made a huge difference, I think, in my ability to, to lead. But when it came down to it, much later in my career, as HP merged with Compaq, HP did something I thought was very unique and was very beneficial uh, to me and to this team, they they took all the teams they were acquiring and they did something they called adopt and go. And adopt and go was we're not going to mix all these teams together. We're going to see like the workstation team from HP was viewed as the better team, not just, you know, just because they were more experienced. And so the workstation team from HP became the workstation team for the combined company. Turned out that the notebook team from Compaq was adopted, and I was not leading the team at the time, but that team stayed together and had the experience together. And uh, finally, the final part of the story is that uh, there was a, a general manager by the name of Dwayne Zitzner, who was an HP general manager, and he had a bunch of different teams reporting to him, some from HP, some from Compaq. And along the way, a senior leader, my boss, left abruptly. And what Dwayne Zitzner did really impressed me. And again, it goes towards some of the things you talk about in your book, or the main thing, perhaps. He went, and I believe he spoke to just about every single person at my level, at, my, at lower levels from me, about who should lead the team. So he engaged in conversation across the entire notebook team. I mean, I talked to so many people later. He said, oh, I talked to Dwayne about you. And so by having those conversations, it was beneficial for two reasons. He learned a lot about me, you know, good and bad, I'm sure. But he also set me up to have instant credibility with the team because Everyone could say, oh, well, I talked to Dwayne about, about him. He asked me about him. We had a conversation about it. And I think that set me up for success in a way that never would have been the case if Dwayne hadn't taken the time to talk to the team and really find out who was this Ted Clark guy and why, why would I care and why would he be a good leader? So I think <clears throat> it's those three things that that, uh, you know, just my background, my passion for it, uh, the adopt and go, and then uh, Dwayne's conversations, I, I believe, set me up for, for success. Right. Well, let me just recapture these. Actually, I, I captured six elements that brought you to that point. Number one, you've had the right foundation in terms of education and background such that number two, when you identify, when you saw that product that you became passionate about, yeah. the, the early days of notebook computing, mobile computing, that there was something that you could respond to with, okay? 
so that second thing, you became laser focused on, on a product, on a category. Yes. Not necessarily always the solution for everybody, but certainly in your case, it served you. Your number three was you actually became passionate about helping a customer, understanding a customer, and you, you developed a bridge from your passion to the product to the, the passion to the customer, and, and that was critical. And um, number four that you mentioned, you, you've learned to tell a simple, powerful story. These are the four elements of initial preparation for you. The second or the next two, which are very interesting, is the, uh, the, mer- the merger strategy that HP implemented as adopt and go. And this is interesting because I, I've been involved and seen a number of merger and acquisition efforts. And not always this strategy works best, but in this case, it delivered, it was obviously an accelerated, accelerating strategy. And the, the number six is so powerful story that you just told. Essentially, you were promoted to a role where you were really being set up to succeed. Every week we see people being promoted to situations where there isn't the kind of holistic system thinking and where they are not set up for success. So th- that story for yourself and your experience is, is totally unique. Yes. Uh, and again, it was reflecting on our conversation that I, I put those two, just the fact that you talk about conversations and how it's the most powerful currency in business. And I thought, you know, I, uh, I've always been indebted to Dwayne for having the trust and faith in me, but I realized uh, he there was a method to his <laughs> to his decision making and uh, it turned out i think it turned out well for everyone certainly for me right so now there is this other factor which is very difficult no one can control but you are there taking yes. the, re- the reins of the organization 2004 just when there is a, a definitive inflection and mobile computing or as you said laptops at the time come into the foreground. What do you do then? How do you go? Describe that first few years. You and I started to interact a couple of years uh, or around about a year after you were in, in, in the role. Right. And this, this uh, business was rapidly growing. Describe some of the, the learning stages and, and the key insights that developed in you at that time, please. Well, it was... It was absolutely a rocket ship ride. It was a tremendous amount of fun combined with a tremendous amount of stress. As uh, one of the things you mentioned is that some point along the way, it was several years later, uh, we were literally shipping one notebook per second. If you do the math or more than that, it's 30 plus million notebooks a year at that pace. And What you learn first, I think, is that, and I believe this goes for a lot of things about leadership, but there's a propensity for action. You act and then course correct. And I'm a big believer in that. And I saw that in a lot of cases where obviously you have to define where you're going and you have to have the objectives and the strategies. But um, one thing I learned, I think, mostly from the compact side of things was there's a little bit of a fire ready aim, if you will. (laughs) Yes. And and I far prefer that to, you know, ready, 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 aim, let's aim for a while. And then, okay, I think we should fire. And so I had this team of people who, first of all, were experienced, but when you think about it, when you're shipping um, several million notebooks a month, the supply chain is incredibly complex and there are millions and millions and millions of parts and truly billions of dollars on the line. And so you've got to get it right. And so detail matters. So action, course correction, details, focus on the details. And then for the team, I think you keep the enthusiasm high. I mean, 
it, 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 the enthusiasm is high. Everybody's in it together. And uh, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. You have to be able to laugh among the team. You have to be able to laugh at your mistakes, even though they're, they're painful uh, and you just keep moving. So I'd say a couple of other quick things. Let me just uh, actually yeah. ask, you, sure. ask you on your number three there. You said action, course correction, attention to details. Double click this one for me in the sense of both continuing to manage the, the forest, but also the, the individual trees, so to speak, seeing, yeah. seeing the macro and managing the, the, the micro, the details. What, what was your system? What was your learning about how you do this best? Well, uh, again, all credit to the team and the, all of the sub-teams um, uh, that, that made all of this happen. I mean, there were tens of people planning supply chain parts and logistics and everything, you know, going into hundreds of, of, of people. So I certainly myself couldn't drill down in every detail. However, we spent a lot of time going into the detail of what are our objectives and how do we manage this complexity in, uh, in delivering all of these products. I think one of the things that I did that was very much appreciated is I didn't double click too much down into the details. Mm. I would allow the teams to figure it out. Now that doesn't mean I was invisible. I think it's important for leaders, you know, to kind of spend some time in the trenches and try and understand exactly what's going on. Although <laughs> I learned that a lot of what I had were opinions that weren't based on fact. You have to listen. And <laughs> again, you have to have a conversation to understand this. And I will say a book that was very influential to me was Colin Powell's book, my American journey, where he talks about how he would actually go into, you know, a platoon and ask people about what they did, or he learned how to fire a particular uh, motorized weapon. You know, he wanted the training. And, and I took that to heart. And of course, didn't do it to the level of detail. But I certainly believe that you've kind of got to get in there and and be part of the team as well as lead the team. So, Right. You once said to me that one of the most important jobs that you had was to do the blocking and, and tackling by which you meant protect your team. Well, that's from, true. From corporate headquarters. And you said to me, I, my job is to get the direction and to get the, the big picture framework and then get out of the way and, and actually let them do yes. the work that they need to do, and I need to make sure that they are uh, as free in executing as can be and not disrupted in their work. It was, it was uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because it was more than just allowing the teams, it was running interference with all of the things I would just call busy work that comes down, especially in a large corporation that you know, these reports or these presentations, whatever it was, and try to do, I mean, some of it's valuable. You have to have metrics, you have to have scorecards, all of those things. But mainly when it's that much growth and that much uh, intensity, you have to let people give them some breathing room to learn and to execute. And, and I, I would add one more thing, and that is you also have to celebrate the success. Right. So, I mean, you know, hitting schedules, launching products, shipping huge tens, tens and tens of thousands of units in a, in a particular model at a holiday cycle where you just can't miss, you know, <laughs> as one of my region friends would tell me, you know, Christmas is coming and we know exactly when it is and, you know, you don't get a few extra days. So, when those things, when, when we were successful, you have to celebrate. That's, that's mainly with, I think, 
letting people know that they've achieved their goal and they've done a good job and, and it's appreciated. Yes, yes. You said that it's the propensity for action and, and then course correcting on the move. So let me ask an, another angle in this. In terms of what is your, if, if you needed to try to codify your approach or your philosophy, if, if, you, if you have something like this about making business decisions and how you think about evaluating opportunities and risk, how would you describe your approach to, to, to that kind of a challenge? Well, you know, that, that's a difficult question in that some of the answer to that, right, is it, it depends on the particular problem. But, but I learned at an early age, I mean, one of my earliest memories of leadership was back in the Boy Scouts, if you'll allow me to digress for a moment. Sure. And I remember, you know, in, in Boy Scouts, I don't know how old you are, 10 or 11 or something, and you're, you're an entry that got tender foot, if you will. And they got a bunch of us together and they gave us something to do. I don't even remember what it was. And we needed to, we needed to get going and do it. There were six or seven of us and it was a little test. Of, and there was this one kid who just started giving direction. He started doing something and that has, and, and everybody started following. And I thought, well, I not even sure. I think this guy's really all that capable, but he just started taking action. And what I've come to believe is that natural leaders have a propensity for action. It doesn't mean that they're good leaders. Good leaders, I believe, have a propensity for taking the right action. But natural leaders, I believe, and I've observed in my, in my career, are the ones that are willing to step out there and say, let's get something done. Now, <laughs> you know, a lot of them, you might not believe in the action they're taking, and that's where you need to uh, have the analysis and take the time. But overall, I would take someone who's willing to take action, learn from the action, course correct, and keep moving. That I, I think makes for effective leadership. Again, it has to be the right action. So I'm not just saying, you know, go out there and start doing stuff. But it's, I think it's, I just err on the side and I tell my kids and uh, I, tell, I tell folks that I consult with, I would err on the side of a propensity for action. Indeed. And, 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 and again, that, that kind of, as you know, in our, I'm more focused on executing and that's just another way of execution, I think, is the repeated steps of taking the right action. Right. So that's, that's kind of my philosophy. Yes. So Ted, when you consult today to startups and such, and when you come to look at a new product and try to evaluate its future, what, what do you look at? What do you examine? Well, it's cliche to say, you know, what is the customer going to get out of this? but you have to do that first. I mean, what in the world is a customer going to do this and why do they care? Okay. So it's kind of, that's classic marketing stuff, but it's, it's very real and very important. And then does the product deliver on that? Does the product provide that value or have that value proposition? And, you know, some of that is judgment. Uh, at, at Compaq and HP, we did a tremendous amount of market research and spent tens or hundreds of thousand dollars on market research. And there's some value in that. But you also have to have a basic knowledge and learning of what just customers want. And does this make sense? So um, I would say, again, what is the customer looking for? Does this product meet that need? Does that make sense? And then finally, no product is going to be perfect, but is the product good enough? And I also learned early on that it is much better, as painful as it is, to kill the product before it's launched than to try and launch a product 
that isn't good enough. And some of that is a gray area. You know, some of that is judgment, if not a lot of it. But I've been in a lot of situations where as painful as it is, I was glad that we made a decision not to launch a product. And it was probably as good or better decision than launching a, um, you know, an industry changing product. Yes. Yes. It's, it's curious. You, you're focusing on judgment in, in how you address this. And um, th- this aspect of judgment and the capacity to make the right gut decision has been studied. And, and you said to me back in the days when you were in the field that often you do use gut or judgment because, yeah. and I think the way you said it, there is tremendous amount of data, but the data is never complete. And there is a sum total of similar situations that you have seen before that provide you with some capacity to look at a complex equation and say, this is what we should do. I can't exactly prove to you why, but I, I know that's what we have to do. And, and more often than not, at this stage in the game, when you've been to many of those situations, it comes out right uh, rather than wrong. Yes, I, you know, I mentioned execution. I, I put that part of the knowledge of, about leading under experience. I mean, the judgment comes from experience. And I happened to lead a team that was very, very experienced in launching new products, in sustaining products, in knowing how to, uh, you know, course correct. So that judgment wasn't just, I mean, the gut part of the judgment was we've, we've done a lot of this before. And in fact, the value of experience is you also know what not to do. And that's where the judgment really comes in and is effective. So executing with experience is uh, really where that judgment comes from. Yes, yes. One of the things that I enjoyed very much about our collaboration, because for some six or seven years, you brought me to design and choreograph your end of the year strategy effort. Yeah. where we would reflect on what has been achieved and then look forward into Horizon 3 and into Horizon 2 and the near-term priorities. And in these sessions, you would often, as you said, your team was very experienced, so you'd often let your team present a variety of ideas and debate openly. And then you would always, always step in in the right moment to present a point of view. And I appreciated very much the way you encouraged free thinking and debate on your team. But then also when you decided this was decision time and you then reasoned openly why you were making the decisions that you were making. And I believe in part this was responsible to the the reason why you were able to create this outcome of what I have observed to be quite an extraordinary teamwork with what we call radical level of trust because people felt not just empowered to bring the best ideas they knew where you stood they knew where you stand and they understood why you have decided to make the decisions and that take the direction that you have taken and this was part of the formula that, that i've observed you lead with with your team now one of your best team members said to me about you one day i don't think i ever shared this with you Uh with 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 with, (laughs) with ted with ted most of this is an intuitive play (laughs) Uh, so i'm I'm curious reflect first of all on the way i described this and and whether it was just a you again going with uh, by your gut intuition or was this a behavior that you worked to develop, to exhibit? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. And, and as, as you put it that way, I'm thinking that one of, one of the benefits I think that I had at that time was there was already a lot of trust uh, among our entire team. And I also had enough experience to know that 
I had been through many offsite meetings with different, you know, uh, with different leadership things. And you, a lot of times come away from those meetings thinking, okay, well, did we really decide anything? Like we were just there for a day and a half or two days and we talked a lot, but nothing happened. And I always came away from those thinking about, well, was that a waste of time? Are we going to do any, you know, everybody would take action items and all that, but, but let's really try to make a decision. And so part of it wasn't always that I thought I knew the right answer, but again, you act on the decision and then you see if you can course correct with the rest of the team. It's the same kind of thing, except in the conversation. So I really, I, I believe that the team and I, I certainly believe in creating frameworks for people, not so much all the answers, but this is the framework we're going to use to make these decisions, or this is the framework that we're going to develop so that we all know where we sit on the map, if you will, of where we're trying to go. And so part of that, I think, was intuitive for me because I tend to think in pictures more so than words. And it just so happened that I had a team with whom we had communicated often, and uh, it just it just came naturally. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yes. it, it yes. was partly gut, partly discipline to say, okay, we're going to close this because I want people leaving here thinking we actually you know, did something and made a decision and, and, and we've got a direction to go. Two questions together when you reflect back on your professional career. What's one thing you would do different or change if you could, question one. And question two, what's, what is one thing that if you could, you would prefer to know earlier and apply even earlier? I think both of those actually have a similar answer. And, and that is, uh, I would have, I should have, collectively, we should have taken more long-term risk. We should have invested in a few risky future alternatives, whether to notebooks or you could say mobile phones. Um, as it turned out, my team wasn't really uh, responsible for what's now called mobile computing or mobile phones. But Nothing was really going on in that area in HP in the in the groups that were supposed to be doing those things. And I just we should have just maybe what we would call a you know skunk works projects or figured out some way to invest in longer term, higher risk either products or solutions. Because I think it's it was such an intense execution focused environment that that took all of our and I mean it was paying a lot of the bills for the mm -hmm. company right so we couldn't mess that up but um, and and to give you credit Aviv and and your uh, leadership and your uh, frameworks for all of this that the, the, the notion of having action and reflection and action and reflection you know, when we first started, one of the things I, I told you was, well, <laughs> I, I, I think I called it all the touchy-feely stuff, right? And the fact of the matter is, I learned that it's extremely important to step back and reflect. And when you do that, and had we done that more outside of the sessions we were in with you, we might have taken bigger risks for the longer term. That Horizon 3 was in our sights, but not beyond the, the wall that we were asked to, that we were asked to play in. Right. And, and right. so that relates to your second part of your question. I would say that same thing about me personally is earlier, early on, I learned that there were customers out there. And if you worked hard, you could get customers. But I think I would have 
taken more risk, not so much in my career, but in in my in, in my direction of teams. You know, try it, go for it, invest a little bit for the long term, have something about what's next, as opposed to, you know, let's capitalize on what's right in front of us. This is a fascinating comment because it's becoming now a repetitive theme that I've heard from a number of executives advancing the career or, or retire that say one thing I would do different is I would take more risks. Yes, I, I haven't, I really, you're talking to a lot more executives and, and people than I am, but that's without question for me. And, and I try to give some guidance to, to my kids that way. Of course, they don't listen to me because, <laughs> <laughs> because we know how that works. But, but um, anytime they come with me with a, you know, an A or B decision, I, I try to help them reason it as what's better for you in the long term. And, you know, so what if you fail and what are you going to learn from it? As opposed to, oh, well, you know, you'll make uh, $300 more a month or whatever it, whatever it might be. Right. Yeah, it's instructive. And obviously what I have in mind when you describe that is, is my ongoing conversation with my son who runs his own startup uh, company. But that's for a separate conversation. Yes, but good. A good, a good one. So you titled your generous Amazon book review on Create New Futures, Deep Insights into What Matters. And perhaps you already started to answer the question I'm, I'm asking, but I have two questions. First, in your experience, what belongs, what in your mind belongs inside that What Matters bucket, that What Matters category? And second, what were for you, and you mentioned already some, what were for you the most relevant insight when you read through the book? Right. Well, I'm going to give you some, well, I'll get to that in the second part of my answer. I mean, you know, really at the end of it, it's, it's maybe cliche or obvious, but what really matters are the people that you are, are leading. It's how the people are part of the team. And I, I certainly believe that having open, trusting communication with the team, and I used to frame it as good leaders listen, but you educated me in your book, especially, and that's because so many leaders don't listen, but really it's more good leaders, great leaders have meaningful conversation. And, and that is a, that's a slightly different than good leaders listen, right? It's, it's that you you learn from each other and it's a two-way dialogue. Uh, and I think I certainly worked for plenty of leaders who it was a one-way dialogue. There was no listening. So I said, well, I'm not going to be that. I'm going to listen, but it's even more. And that's what you point out. It's what matters are the people and that the people have the ability to communicate, to, to have a conversation with all levels of the organization, including their leaders. So I think your book was very powerful in the way, in the examples that you give in, in crystallizing that for me beyond, you know, good leaders are good listeners. And so what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. The second part of the question was what were the, the other key insights uh, oh. for you that resonated in the book. But just before you, you get there, uh, just as you were describing what you're describing now, it brought back to me that, and I don't know if you remember, you and I, we have been in conversation for 14 months on and off before we, <laughs> before we that, worked. That's correct. Yeah? That's correct. I mean, you proved to me through ongoing conversation that it wasn't, you know, you, you, were, you were in this to provide value to me and my team. And I had never had anyone invest that much time. And uh, I was very impressed with that. And then, of course, I had a, a um, I would say, a budding superstar in Matthew Wagner, yep. who I said, okay, Matt, 
you know, I'm impressed. You go work with Aviv and figure out. And uh, I believe the two of you came up with some tremendous, a tremendous framework for working with the team. And, and after that, it was, it was, it was on. So actually you tested, actually you tested uh, one thing before you let me work with Tom Mitchell and his team. Oh, first. that's right. I forgot about that. And, and when you got word about that experience, that's right. That led to the collaboration with. Uh, that's right. Well, Tom Mitchell is a, a still keep in touch with him. He's a very, he's a, he's a tough, uh, he's a tough evaluator. He's one of those guys that's, uh, you know, it's about results. And did he feel that his team was better off after the, uh, the sessions than, than before? And he gave you a uh, high marks for that. So it, it provides me an opportunity because to, to make a point about people in business, both Tom Mitchell and yourself in a totally uh, two different ways would qualify as what you call hard charging, data driven, focused on action and results type leaders. And at the same time, you both were completely open and amenable to embrace the approach, the philosophy that we are discussing here, which is that we ultimately elevate the performance of the team by the clarity and the coherence of conversation and by enabling the team to, to build alignment from the personal and the individual passion that they each bring to the table and the contribution that they can make to some kind of a unified vision, unified rallying cry all those were part of the elements of the choreography that, that we enabled. And you, both of you were a proof point for me that no person is too hard or too business focused to the point of not seeing the value and reason and powerful outcome that we create when we encompass and include our humanity and who we are as people. Because as you just said, in the end, and in the beginning and in the end, it's all about the people around the table and how they play together. That's right. That is what matters. And we didn't make it easy for you. Okay. I mean, there was a lot of skepticism. And um, the fact that you became part of our uh, annual uh, strategy and planning process is one thing, but that also that we would use you and your skills and capabilities for other uh, other things, as well as recommend uh, you to other parts of HP. That doesn't happen uh, with with myself or Tom Mitchell or any of my team without really seeing some some significant uh, results. So. Uh, that says a lot for uh, the amount of time you invested and then the results that that were delivered so yes. it was it was good it was a two way it, it was a two way investment but thank you for the kind words but i i did stop you when i think you were just going to uh, make reference to another uh, one or two points that for you resonated in a meaningful way uh, from creating new features Oh, well, I mentioned one earlier. I think the most powerful one for me, again, being that I'm, I'm the, at the time, especially since we were executing well, we were delivering results, we were hitting our metrics, we were, you know, on the right path. I, I think we were. Um, it was action. In, and in your book, you have a big box that's labeled action in a tiny little box that's labeled reflection, that was us. And the most powerful part in reading your book and the most powerful part about working with you was it is important to step back. Uh, I mean, we knew what debriefing was. We would debrief, sure. How did we, that's part of course correcting, but that's not reflection to me in, in, the, in the biggest sense. Mm -hmm. Re reflection is, all right, if we had to do it over again, you know, how would we do it differently? And now that we're going to uh, look for this, become part of this new framework, what does that mean? And 
say, as a product example, the emergence of tablets and phones and how does our framework change, we better figure this out or we might execute ourselves into oblivion, right? Right, right. And you were instrumental and the book is that, that notion of equal time, and I'm not sure it means exactly equal time, but equal emphasis, let's say, on reflection and action, uh, I think is the most powerful part of the book for me. And, and the biggest learning that I've had with you in terms of the, the contribution that was made. It's an interesting comment because almost every person when exposed first time to this slide that I often use where there is a big red box of action and a small little blue box of reflection, almost every person recognizes themselves in it. Mm -hmm. And people say, wow, that's me. And people often say... I have to change this. I have to create more reflection time. And when I meet with them six months later, often they will tell me it's the one thing I haven't been able to follow through as much as I wanted. Right. And yeah. I think it's, it's a huge big comment on two things. First, or actually three things. The first is for many people, it's not clear how to best be reflective because different people are wired differently. Some people need to be reflective by going for a drive or some others will actually get their best reflection when they exercise in the gym or go for a run or play golf. Uh, and yet others will best be reflective when they are in a dialogue with another person or with a coach or with somebody that would lead them in the, the right direction. So that's the first comment that surfaced for me there. The second is that behavioral change is not easy. And right. unless you can demonstrate to people a repeatable behavior that has its own validation loop of how they are able to extract value of that behavior, they are not always prone to uh, find the discipline to, right. to hold to that behavior. And the third, which is perhaps the biggest point, which is you may want it and you may even have the tools to continue to exercise this, this behavior but if the ecosystem, if the bigger corporate culture is toxic and reactive and fear-based, it's very difficult to build a deliberative, reflective culture. This, again, is where you were creating these sessions, even in times that were tough for the company, and you were fighting back almost under the radar heading yes. out uh, to, to run some of these offsites because you said this is so important for my team. I'm going to allocate the time. The return on investment and the, re the return on time is going to be significant. Right. Well, let, let me make a couple of comments on that to, to, to give you some credit as well. When I first saw that large action box and small reflection box, I probably said that's me and that's a good thing. <laughs> 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 that's, right. our team. that's our team and that's a good thing. And that's probably why it took 14 months of discussion with me before we, before we <laughs> engaged. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. But I, I think to, to slightly uh, modify one of the things you just said, which is I believe that myself and my team, we all had plenty of time, or this is our, by our nature, we would reflect individually. But it's that reflection when you do it collectively that is of such value. And obviously, you can't do that on the golf course or in the shower or wherever you do your personal reflection. That's why it was so important to get together and have that reflection time as a team. And that's where I think that that's when it made a big difference. So right. uh, that's the... Even if, even if on a daily basis or a weekly basis, you can't spend as much time in reflection, setting aside that time and, and really spending it in thinking about where you've been and where you're going is, is uh, very, uh, very important. And I probably learned that a little late, but we, we did a lot to catch up. One, one other way to say this is that we cannot assume that we are sapient just because we call ourselves sapient 
in terms of a species. We actually have to exercise sapiens. <laughs> and, um, and the fact of the matter is, and you've seen it so many times, Ted, more than I probably, you often can get a, very, a group of very smart people around the table, and more often than not, they will be prone to producing collective stupidity rather than collective wisdom or collective sapience. Yes. And so I think what you just highlighted there is that there is no substitution, there is no replacement to structured debrief and reflection time in a focused, structured way that begins with retrospection and reflection and leads to some concrete decisions in terms of what are we going to do going forward such that we produce different and better outcomes. Right. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's not necessarily where I started out in terms of thinking about the most important things uh, in leadership. But, but I would say without a doubt, and that, again, that's why to me, that's the most important thing that uh, I found uh, and what matters as part of, as, as part of your book. Great, thank you. So two questions together as we bring this to, to lending and you, you may say it's, it's one and the same, but I'll, I'll let you choose how you want to formulate your, your thinking about this. First is a question I like to ask, which is what advice would you give yourself if you were 25 today and you were searching to find your professional path and See if you want to weave this with any other call to action or parting wisdom from yourself to people listening to create new futures. You know, that's uh, having had some time to reflect now that I uh, have been out of the pressure cooker. It's actually a question I, I do think about. And again, um, I, I think it really does come down to it's I wouldn't I wanted to say take more risk and that's how we had that uh, part of the conversation but it's expand if someone had said expand your horizons earlier and more broadly it, I, that's I think that would be the the um, the best thing meaning try different things have new experiences and you know, don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. What, I, what I've learned about leading uh, teams is, you know, uncertainty is a huge a barrier. And fighting uncertainty is something that great leaders, I think, are able to do and make it look easy. But one's own uncertainty about what's next or what are we doing or is this the right thing? If I could have spent a little more time not worrying about that and just, you know, let it all let it all out there, I think that would have been something I could have learned from earlier. Let uh, me just clarify. Let yes. me just clarify this one. Is it indeed fighting uncertainty or is it finding the capacity to bring forward clarity and confidence inside ambiguity? You often operate it, in an ambiguous yes. space. Yes. And somehow your job as an individual, as a professional, certainly as a leader, is to find those islands of clarity and coherence right. and confidence. Right. I, I think that's well said. In fact, it's, it's that some things early on don't have to be perfectly clear. Just mm. be comfortable with the fact that this will evolve and the learning will. It's, it's kind of the same thing as, you know, enjoy the journey. Right. But a little more focused than that in that I'm going to try this and, you know, let's just let's let's see how it goes as opposed to, well, I need to know I'm, I'm a pretty I need to know how I'm going to get from here to there, if you will. And this may be a better way to say it. I need to see the steps. And there are some things that I would really and some of the some of the things in your book about, you know, imagine the future and then work backwards will sometimes you know, you don't have the perfect way to work backwards. So just keep imagining that future and, and, and try it out. So I, I, I think, I think that's the, the biggest piece of advice. 
And what I hear in there as well is that when, you, when you're prepared to embrace ambiguity and uncertainty and work into that space, actually these become the greatest uh, trigger for creativity, for innovation, yeah. because in, in actuality, if we try to, to, um, to appreciate the brain science of this, you are, your brain, your synaptic connections are firing in all directions to answer an unresolved riddle or an unresolved problem. And by doing so, you accelerate dramatically the trial and error until you come up with a solution. And in fact, most best ideas and, and breakthrough creativity and innovation is simply a result of a process just like that. So to the degree that you allow yourself that exposure, you dramatically increase your, the chances that you will participate together with others in something new, in something novel. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. Well, this has been an exciting uh, journey and, and exploration with, with you today. I'll try one more uh, question just before we sign off. Sure. And which is, where will you be in 10 years? Oh, now that's a question I hadn't, uh, <laughs> I hadn't anticipated. <laughs> uh, uh, but if, mainly I think as I've <laughs> uh, become on this part of the journey, whatever I'll be doing, it will be actively engaged and with a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. You know, we didn't talk a lot about enthusiasm as a leadership, not, not category, but Property, leadership property. A leadership property, thank you. And, you know, as I said at the beginning, I'm thankful every day and just the, the privilege that we all have in uh, this life that we live in. And, uh, I mean, I just wake up every day being thankful and being enthusiastic about what the day has to bring. So um, whatever it may be, it, it will probably not be the great golf scores I'm shooting. <laughs> Um, but it will be uh, something that I do have a great deal of enthusiasm about and, um, you know, that, that I hope I'm still learning and still uh, making a difference. Wow. That's a, a, a most beautiful answer. Uh, in 10 years, you will wake up enthusiastic, grateful, and ready to learn new things. I'm going That's to... I'm going to steal this one. <laughs> well, you, you steal that one because I really do. I really do mean that. And, and um, I, I feel privileged to have that as, as my 10-year uh, outlook. Thank you so much, Ted. Aviv, it's been a pleasure. Enjoyed talking with you. And uh, best of luck. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Here we are. We've landed this Create New Futures journey. And it's your time to take action, to create your new future. Here are a few steps you can take this week. First, develop propensity for action. Instead of ready, ready, and then more ready, try fire, ready, aim. Natural leaders are prepared to take action. Good leaders take the right action. Second, thoughtfully set up your people to succeed. Promoting someone to be able to take on a new opportunity is only half the job. Setting him or her to succeed is the other half. There is a great joy and energy that you'll experience when people working for you find their own growth and success with your help. Third, be enthusiastic. Enthusiasm is infectious. It opens new doors of possibility. Find enthusiasm about your work, about your team, be enthusiastic about your life and about what you can learn in you today. One more thing. You can reach me directly by phone and on email to explore how we can help you and your team create your new future. See you next time.